Greetings. I'm delighted to welcome you to the third lecture of our new series, Arts at Graham. This week, the theme is Museums, Objects as Evidence. My name is Emily Lynn Osborne, and I'm the Interim Dean of the Graham School of Continuing Professional and Liberal Studies. I am also a professor here in the Department of History at the University of Chicago. If you just came in, you may have heard some of the music that was playing. That was Sun Ra, Door of the Cosmos. Sun Ra, who spent a number of years here in Chicago, combined in this piece his dual interest in ancient Egyptian mythology and in outer space. The enig enigma of the intersection of space and time stand at the center of today's talk with Dr. Foy Skalf from the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute. First, a note about the format of this presentation today. We are recording it so that we may post it online at a later date for people to watch it. This is a webinar, so you are not able to use your microphone and your camera is turned off. But you are able to communicate with us and through to the moderators by asking questions through the question and answer box. We encourage you to do so. Dr. Scalf will take breaks during his talk to answer questions from the audience. We will likely not be able to answer all of your questions, but when we do, we will say your name when we do so. You'll find the button to open the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now, for those of you who are new to the University of Chicago Graham School, I'll quickly tell you a bit more about who we are and what we do, as well as how the series came about. I'll then introduce this, our speaker as well as my fellow moderator. The Graham School functions, as I often say, as the front door of the University of Chicago. We bring the world to the University of Chicago and the University of Chicago to the world, to you. The Graham School offers a range of classes and courses of study through the liberal arts. In all of our offerings, we strive to connect with curious, engaged individuals, and our instructors and faculty are dedicated to fostering camaraderie and community through learning. We are a place where people come to join others and ask critical inquiring questions about the world around us. It is from this dedication to humanistic inquiry that we partnered with cultural institutions from across the university to launch Arts at Graham. The, pandem the pandemic has fostered great isolation and separation. We are no longer able to gather at movie houses and theaters, museums, bookstores, and performance halls. Indeed, here at the University of Chicago, we are home to nine galleries and museums, all of which have been shuttered and no longer function as they ought to. But the pandemic has also made possible new forms of congregation, new forms of gathering, such as these Zoom webinars. We have sought this week at Arts at Graham to gather together to support and celebrate our museums and to learn from them. Today, we focus on the Oriental Institute, which is a world-renowned museum for the history, art, and archaeology of the ancient Middle East. And with our speaker today, we are going to study space and time and how ancient Egyptians approached its measurement. Our speaker today, Dr. Foy Scalf, is a research associate and the head of research archives at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. He earned his PhD in Egyptology also from this institution. His research focuses on ancient Egyptian religion and sacred scripture, language and linguistics, and the cultural context for textual transmission. At the Oriental Institute, Foy is dedicated to bringing the ancient world to the public through continuing education, outreach, and public scholarship. Another introduction is also in order. My fellow, oh, one more thing I'll say is that if you want to continue to study with Dr. Foy Scalf, you may do so this fall. There are a number of classes that are being offered through the Oriental Institute. Uh, but my final introduction is my fellow moderator is Adriana Obioles. She is a PhD student in art history and her research focuses on 20th century art of Latin American, Latin America. She is passionate about public arts programming and is supporting the Graham School this summer and fall as a graduate student intern. And we're grateful for her help and support. And with that, I turn the stage over to Foy. Hi, everyone. 
I'd like to welcome you uh, and thank Emily and everybody at the Graham School for organizing the Arts at Graham's series of lectures and for asking us uh, at the Oriental Institute uh, to participate in that. So today I'm going to be talking to you about ancient Egyptian conceptions of time, how they measured time, how they divided time, some of the tools that they used to do that, and also some claims they made about some of those devices. Um, we're going to be focusing today on the Oriental Institute uh, at the University of Chicago, which, as Emily mentioned, has been closed since the beginning of the pandemic in March, but I do have good news. Uh, they are looking to open back up to the public um, sometime in the next month or so for scheduled small visits. Uh, so keep your eye on the Oriental Institute website for news about that reopening and how to schedule a visit that you might want to come and see our collection. And I hope that after showing you some of the remarkable pieces that we have in the collection tonight, uh, that, that will encourage you to want to do that. So the Oriental Institute is really dedicated. It's, it's one of the University of Chicago's first interdisciplinary institutes and it's dedicated to the study of the ancient Middle East and the North African region. So today we're going to be talking about uh, material mainly from Egypt. Uh, and that material, just to give you a brief preview, will uh, consist of a number of timekeeping devices, ancient timekeeping devices that are in the Oriental Institute collection. So the one that you see on the screen here, this is often referred to as Tut's or King Tut's astronomical instrument. Uh, this is from the 14th century BC. It's one of the earliest timekeeping devices that we have in our collection. And in fact, one of the earliest um, of this particular type of device from ancient Egypt. We will be talking about this water clock. Uh, that's also, uh, both of these are on display, I should say, in our, our galleries at the Oriental Institute. And you can learn more by going online. And I have links on the screen there that you can follow if you're interested in that. Um, and this is from a much later period. We'll talk about the date of this water clock later, um, but I'm just giving you a bit of a preview of some of the objects that we will be talking about. And of course, the Oriental Institute has uh, material from much later periods. Uh, so for example, this astrolabe uh, from the 18th century um, that was purchased in Syria, but is uh, designed for use in um, the area of Iran. And today I won't be talking about these astrolabes, but I just want to point out that uh, these timekeeping devices range a number of periods, um, and the Oriental Institute has examples in their collection and on display of some of these. Now, up front, I just want to mention that um, I had some readings and discussion questions that I had posted online uh, and before this lecture. So if you have those available at several points throughout the lecture, I'm going to stop to answer questions that you might have about um, particular um, aspects that we're discussing, or these pieces in particular. And at that time, I'll sort of give you a, a warning that that's coming, and then the moderators can uh, go through the questions and discussion points in the chat box and pick um, a few things that we can highlight. Of course, we can't get to everybody. There's far too many uh, to get to, um, but we'll do our best um, to answer as many questions as we can. And so those readings and discussion points are very much focused on the first two objects I showed here on the slide and then also a further inscription. So what I wanna cover uh, tonight or give you a, a bit of a flavor of, a taste of, is the ancient Egyptian calendars. So how they divided up time throughout the year and the, the manner in which they did that. Um, Timekeeping instruments that they, that they used to divide up that time and to measure various typically astronomical phenomena. Uh, this includes water clocks, or uh, the other term used for water clocks, clepsydra or clepsydrae, and then also this inscription uh, that is part of the reading packet I, I sent out of a man named Amenemhat who claims, or at least I should say earlier interpretations of this inscription, um, have interpreted it as a claim of the invention of one of these water clocks. So this is a rough overview about the topics that we'll be covering uh, this evening. So the first thing that I wanna talk about or that we should talk about when we're looking at um, ancient Egypt and how they conceptualize time is some of the words and um, conceptions that they had for it. And this is almost always uh, forefronted in discussions of ancient Egyptian time. They had two primary vocabulary items to describe different types of time. One was this word on the screen, jet. And these 
terms are often translated with something like forever or eternity, but jet is really a reference to linear time. So time that goes forward where one thing happens after the other. And a great example to illustrate this linear type of time is the ancient Egyptian regnal year. That is each pharaoh, they would come to the throne, they would serve a number of years, so regnal year one, regnal year two, regnal year three, et cetera. Then the next pharaoh would come to the throne and serve his regnal year. So these were um, linear time going forward one uh, event after the other. But then they also had another vocabulary item, neche, which you see here on the screen. Um, that's also often translated as forever eternity, but this really signified cyclical time. And the one um, way that you can see that is the use of the sun disk determinative at the end of the word here. Uh, we call these signs in the hieroglyphic writing system determinatives that come at the end of words. And this is indicating this cyclical nature of this lexical item. So what you have when you really put these um, terms together is a sort of corkscrew conception of time where in some ways time is linear and goes forward and then in other ways, so for example, in particular, with the celestial phenomenon, so uh, the rising and setting of the sun, the rising and setting of the stars, et cetera, um, these cyclical, or the rising of the Nile every year, this cyclical phenomena that um, happens day after day or year after year. And so this is sort of how the Egyptians uh, broadly conceptualized um, concepts dealing with time. Now the ancient Egyptians, when they tried to manage their world uh, and break this kind of time up, they developed a number of calendars. One was a civil calendar, uh, and this was a calendar of 365 days, so it more or less adhered to the solar year, so the time it takes for um, the Earth to revolve around the sun. Uh, obviously, with one quarter day short, we'll talk more about that. So they had this civil calendar. They had actually at least one, but just depending on who uh, you read, the scholars debate this, uh, a number of lunar calendars based on the phases of the moon. And then they also had at least one fiscal calendar. In fact, there's recently been uh, some work suggesting uh, an additional fiscal calendar, a fiscal calendar being just like our fiscal year, where your uh, fiscal year might begin in July and end in June. Uh, the Egyptians had uh, a fiscal year uh, in order to collect taxes around a certain time of the year. So they had these different calendars. And what I want to focus on is this first one, the civil calendar, uh, primarily just to give you a sense, again, of how uh, the Egyptians structured the time uh, throughout the year. So this civil calendar, it was broken up into weeks. A week in ancient Egypt was 10 days, so they're often called decades from the Greek word uh, for 10. So these 10 day blocks uh, served as the Egyptian week. There were three weeks in one month, so making 30 days. You had 12 months in the year. So you had 36 weeks of 10 days equals the 360 days. So now you're five days short of the 365 day solar calendar. So they add five days at the end uh, called the epigominal days, which just means tacked on, added on at the end to give you the 365 day um, calendar, which of course is a legacy we are still using today. This, uh, this calendar would of course with leap years to account for the one quarter of the day that it is short. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that affected ancient Egyptian timekeeping here shortly. Now, this year was broken up. So in e Egyptian, they called the year Rinpet. That was their word for year. It was broken up to a number of seasons. The Egyptian word is tear for seasons. You had the Akit season. This was uh, often translated as inundation season. So this is the time when the Nile would flood and the people would be basically building dams and dikes and reservoirs to control that flood water in preparation for the next season, which was parrot, the seeding or growing season. So as the Nile flood started to recede, then you would actually start the agricultural cycle by planting your plants and growing them. And then the last season was called Shimu, which is harvest season. So you can see that the year is very much divided up along this agricultural cycle and the rising uh, and settling of the Nile that completely dominated 
um, and shaped the ancient Egyptians' lives. So you had four months in each of these seasons, and that makes up the 12 months of the Egyptian calendar. Now those civil calendar months, they have their own names, so you can see some of those here on the right, like the month of Thoth, uh, Paofi, Hathir, etc. And there's also names for the lunar calendar months, typically named after major festivals in those months. So like the festival of Teki, for example, is a festival associated with the god Thoth. So, and these names, I should just say, they continue uh, and continue all the way down uh, into Coptic where they were still used and in some ways still used uh, in the liturgical uh, language of the Coptic church today. Coptic is just the last phase of the ancient Egyptian language. So you can see the Coptic uh, versions of these month names on the right. So this is sort of how the ancient Egyptians structured their civil calendar throughout the year. If you sort of lay this on a grid, this is what you get. Three seasons, each season has four months, that gives you the 360 days, and then the five epigominal days at the end to give you the 365 day calendar that basically adhered to uh, the solar year. Okay, now the beginning of the year for the Egyptians was called the Wepet Rinpet, or the opening of the year, what we might translate as New Year. And in theory, in an ideal setting, this Wepet Rinpet, the opening of the year, would correspond to the heliacal rise of the star Sothis, or Sirius. Uh, Sothis is the Greek version of the name Sopdet, the ancient Egyptian name for the star Sirius. And I'll mention, uh, I'll show you sort of what it means by heliacal in a second. This just means when the star rises right before uh, sunrise, okay? So the beginning of the year, the agricultural year, was marked by this rising of the star Sirius after a period of invisibility, and it would rise right before sunrise, and that marked the time when the uh, rising of the Nile was about to happen. This signaled that for the ancient Egyptians. And in an ideal calendar, in an ideal situation, this would happen on the first month of the first season, day one. Now, because the Egyptian calendar was only 365 days long and it's missing that quarter day, it means that the heliacal rise of Sirius typically didn't happen on the first day of the first month of this civil calendar because it wandered. It was always a quarter day short, which means it would repeat this Sothic cycle, as it's called, uh, would repeat every 1,461 years. That is, if in year one, the star Sirius rose heliacally on day one of the first month of the first season, 1,461 years later, it would do that again on that same date. And when we're talking about this, to give you some sense of it, this is what we really mean, and I'm using Stellarium, a software I put a link to in the chat box to show you this. Here is Sirius rising just above the horizon. As the sun comes up, the date that I put into this software for this, uh, July 21st, 139 AD, happens to be a date when we have a recorded record that the first day of the first month of the Egyptian year corresponded with this heliacal rise of Sirius at, uh, at sunrise, at dawn. And of course, what happens is as the sun rises, the sky gets bright and you can no longer see Sirius until the next night. And if you wanna sort of picture, because for the ancient Egyptians, these astronomical observations were critical for how they structured time in their lives, obviously, as you can see, in order to sort of picture what's going on here, this is a little graphic to show you how this is working, just to sort of explain it. This is the Earth going around the sun and having its uh, rotational, uh, its, its rotation every, every day. If a person is standing at spot A here on this slide, the dark side of the Earth at this time of the year, they will not be able to see the star Sirius, which is marked here by an Egyptian hieroglyph, uh, that red sepid for the name Sopdet. They cannot see it because the sun's in the way here and the dark side of the earth is on this side. But as the earth continues to revolve around the sun, when it gets to the solstice or near there, a little bit after, if you're standing on 
this side of the Earth at the beginning of the night, you necessarily wouldn't see Sopta, but by the time it revol uh, rotates to the next morning and you're standing in uh, spot B1, then you would see the star rise just before sunrise, like we saw in the animation I just showed you. So it's this period when the Earth is in this position with regard to the star Sirius, that Sirius is invisible, and then it reappears during the Earth's uh, revolution around the sun. And this period of invisibility is approximately 70 days. And some of you might find that interesting because this period of 70 days is actually the same period that they used in the embalming process in ancient Egypt. So that for those of you who have read Herodotus, many of you probably have, or, or at least you've heard of him, he notes that the Egyptians uh, when they're performing the embalming, they cover the body in natron for 70 days. And this 70-day period is linked to the 70-day period uh, for when uh, these stars are not visible. So it's not just Sirius that is invisible for these periods, but other stars that we'll talk about as well. So these uh, astronomical observations are incredibly important, not just for the practical lives of the ancient Egyptians, but also for their religious beliefs and mythology as well. And we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, as we go. So this is how the year is structured. And in theory, the civil calendar could be structured around this agricultural year when the star Sirius rises, signaling the flood of the, the coming of the flood of the Nile. That usually happened around the time of August. Uh, then the agricultural year uh, would commence after that. Now, in addition to these broader uh, divisions of time, the Egyptians also broke things down into obviously smaller bits. So you not just have, you had not only the Rinpet for the year, Abed for the months, Heru Ten. So their word for a week was literally just the phrase ten days, uh, then individual days, and then individual hours. Now, for the hours for the Egyptians, they were very practical about this. They divided the day into 24 hours, 12 hours during the day, 12 hours at night. Now, as you know, in the summer, we have more daylight than we have in the winter, and in the winter, we have more darkness. So what that means is that these hours for the Egyptians were not all of the same length. The Egyptians did not use the 60-minute hour at this period. Uh, that's a Babylonian um, importation that comes in later with uh, other Hellenistic developments and Hellenistic period. That's when uh, the 60 minute hour starts to get used. The Egyptians were not using that. They had hours of different, different lengths. They just did, uh, divided the night into 12 and the day into 12. And this also, as I mentioned with the 70 day invisibility of Sirius, help to structure some of their religious beliefs. So for example, here you see a scene from what's called the hourly vigil. So this is the 12 hours of the night. This symbolized death. So for Osiris, he's in the underworld uh, and he's awaiting his resurrection. Uh, and what you see on the screen is a, a scene from hour 10 where uh, Osiris's enemy, the god Seth here is ritually uh, stabbed and tied up. Uh, because Seth had killed Osiris in the earlier episode and dismembered Osiris and threw his body parts into the Nile River. But at the end of this hourly vigil, these gods were watching over Osiris to protect him because, of course, they wanted Osiris to be reborn the next morning. And in fact, Osiris, in this sense, is connected on a continuum um, with uh, the god Re, the sun god. So that when ray sets, when the sun sets in the evening, the Egyptians envisioned that sun as going down into the underworld, joining with the god Osiris, because the god Osiris really represented rejuvenation for the ancient Egyptians, which then allowed the sun to be reborn again the next morning. So these hours of the night were critical mythological hours where the god needed to be protected to ensure this resurrection and the continued existence of the cosmos the next morning. And these hours uh, are often personified or depicted, for example, here in the coffin of Merit Etes, which is in the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. Uh, you can see uh, the female divinities with the stars represent the night hours, and then female divinities with the sun disk represent the hours of the day. So these 
uh, hours, breaking the day up into 24 hours, help to structure not just practical everyday life, but also these uh, mythologies that the Egyptians developed around their gods and the world where they lived. So in order to develop these concepts and to measure these periods of time, obviously the ancient Egyptians had to very closely observe um, astronomical phenomena. So the sun, the moon, the planets that they could see with the naked eye and the background stars, for example. The individuals who were doing that in ancient Egypt um, were called the Imi Winut. That was the title of the job, uh, which sometimes gets translated as astronomer, uh, but it literally means one who is in the hour. You can also see translations as hour watcher. And then, like I said, astronomer, you can see here a hieroglyphic writing of, of the title and also a demotic writing. A demotic is just um, an, another late phase of the Egyptian scripts. And this title is equivalent to uh, the horoscopos um, in Clement of Alexandria, a second century um, Christian theologian. He actually perhaps had witnessed um, an Egyptian uh, festival and he describes the horoscopos, uh, the person in charge of sort of um, these astronomical observations and they carry along with them astronomical instruments. And so the Evi Winut, the one who was in his hour, um, seemed to be uh, equivalent to this uh, Greek term horoscopos. And yes, these individuals uh, were priests uh, and they tended to work in various uh, temples uh, related to the gods and their job was to uh, observe the heavens and then mainly what will, I should say, one of the primary duties was for them to know the hours and the times when the particular rituals were supposed to take place. So what you see here on the screen on the right in this modern reconstruction drawing is uh, two, in theory, Egyptian priests. They're making observations. And when they determine that a certain hour has occurred, they would know to perform certain particular rituals. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we continue to discuss this. And I'll talk more about this reconstruction you see here and what's actually going on. So these hour watchers, these astronomers, were watching uh, the sky very closely and they noticed a number of things. There are things obvious that are obvious um, that you see, but then maybe things that aren't so obvious, especially to us who aren't accustomed to watching these astronomical phenomena as much uh, anymore. And one of these is the difference, for example, uh, between uh, the movement of the background stars and then the movement of items or astronomical phenomena within our solar system that happens against the background stars. So one way to show you this or to um, exemplify this is to talk about the difference between the sidereal month and the synodic month when it comes to uh, the phases of rotation of revolution of the moon. So in this um, graphic here, what you see is the Earth it's going around the sun and then the moon going around the Earth. So a sidereal month is when the moon makes a 360 degree orbit and ends up in the same place. So that's, that would be this black dot here. So the moon goes 360 degrees. So from the Earth perspective, the moon has reached the same point with regard to the background stars that are out here somewhere. But notice that the moon isn't in the same conjunction or the same um, relationship between the earth and the sun. That takes actually a little bit more of its orbit to complete and that's called the synodic month. So the 360 degree re um, revolution to this point would be the sidereal month. That only takes just over 27 days for that to happen. Whereas the synodic month would take almost 30 days, 29 and a half days. So there was a difference between the sidereal month, so what you would have is 27 days, or in that case, three weeks of nine days, which we'll talk about in a second, and the synodic month. And I should just say the synodic month, this longer one, that's what's um, responsible for the phases of the moon that you would see, okay? So as the moon goes around, the phases you see happen because of this relationship between the sun 
uh, the moon and the earth and not necessarily the background stars. So that relationship to the background stars is the sidereal month. Another way to sort of show you how this works, because you know it can be difficult to wrap your mind around it just in looking at um, a graphic, is to look at something like this. A colleague of mine uh, posted on their social media uh, back in April, this image of Venus. These are each individual photos of Venus in the sky at the same time over a period of like four months. And this is a little bit artificial, but it sort of shows you how Venus would travel through the sky uh, relative to the background stars. And I think it's actually even better if we just put this in motion using software. So here we have Venus, this is the same time. So this is looking at the sky in April uh, uh, 2020. You can see the background stars and the constellations. If you went out on a single night and observed the stars in Venus on that single night and watched them move across the sky, you might think that they're all moving together because at that one particular night, they sort of seem to set all together at the same time, which is what you're seeing here on the screen. But if, on the other hand, we go out and at the same time over a consecutive night, so you can see here, we're looking at April 4th, 5th, 6th, et cetera, notice how Venus climbs up in the sky while the rest of the background stars are moving in a different direction. So this shows you how the Egyptians were very carefully observing not just the inner solar system astronomical phenomena like the moon and the sun, but also the relationship between these and the background stars. You can see here actually Mercury rising up in the opposite direction. So this helps to sort of show you how the movement of these phenomena against the background stars could be very important in how you're going to uh, structure time. And ancient Egyptian texts are very clear. They refer to this. So we're not, um, we can be quite certain that we're not interjecting this into the ancient Egyptian belief system or how they reconstructed this. But so, for example, here from a Roman period uh, demotic text where it mentions the offerings that are poured for a deceased person every nine day and every 10 day period. So this nine day period is a reference to the weeks of the sidereal month. So the three weeks of nine days giving you the 27 days of the sidereal month versus the 10 day period, which is of weeks, uh, three weeks of 10 days making up the synodic month. Okay, so we know that the Egyptians were carefully watching for these different phenomena. And we also have references like this which are to the phases of the moon. So here it says, as he, referencing Khonsu, who is a god of the moon, is conceived on the first day of the month, meaning the new moon, when you don't see a moon in the sky, that's the first day. He is born on the second day, so when you see the first sliver of the crescent of the moon, and so on after the fifth day of the month, he has grown old. So they're, they're watching these phases of the moon and giving them technical designations again, for various religious and mythological purposes. So they're watching this very closely. Now, for these Iniwinuts, these astronomers, these ancient Egyptian hour keepers uh, who are watching the sky, they have many tools at their disposal for trying to measure time uh, as they're doing this. One method is what's often called star clocks. And, and I'll just, I should pause for a second here just to say as well that what I will discuss with you tonight as we go through this really represents um, a synthesis of a lot of research from a lot of my colleagues and I'll mention some of them as we go through. So I just want you to want it to be clear that this is very much reliant on, on the work of my colleagues uh, and it's not something that's just my own. But um, they use these star clocks, and sometimes these are called star tables, and I'll mention that in a second because maybe clock is not quite the right word for it. It might conjure in you a misinterpretation, and I'll talk about these star clocks in a second. They had sundials and shadow clocks, and then also these water clocks. So let's look at some of these tools that these Egyptians uh, would use um, to measure time. So let's first look at uh, star clocks. And a lot of what I want to say about star clocks is really reliant on the work of my colleague, 
uh, Sarah Simmons, and you can actually visit. She has an ancient Egyptian astronomy database online, and I put a link to that in the chat, and you can visit that, and she has lots and lots of extra information and a big catalog of all of these um, monuments and also artifacts that are relevant to ancient Egyptian astronomy. Now, when it comes to star tables or star clocks, this is what we're talking about. This is the lid of a coffin. You can see how these coffins uh, look when they're laid out. And what you see here, all of these little stars, these are names for a star or actually groups of stars that are being mapped in the sky. And I'll explain a little bit more about how these work in a second. So these are, this is a table, a catalog of stars, and I'll show you how they work in one minute. And in between, you see some of the representations of um, ancient Egyptian constellations. So for example, here, the foreleg of the bull, this is called Mesketiu, and I've just highlighted it here in yellow on uh, the zodiac of Dendera, uh, just to show you uh, its relationship in that much later zodiac, which again, this by this period, um, the Roman period, they've already adapted Hellenistic astrological concepts. So they have sort of the, the Babylonian slash Greek uh, zodiac that they import. But here, this is around 2000 BC. So this is much earlier than that. And these are ancient Egyptian constellations pre importation of the later zodiac. So you have the Mesketiu or Sach. This is often identified as the constellation Orion. Uh, that's mixed in with these star catalogs. Now, the one thing to, to mention is the context in which we're finding these. Remember, Emily mentioned at the beginning of this that we're the sort of theme for this uh, week is objects as evidence. So we really want to make sure that we're looking at these objects for what they are uh, in their proper context. So these star charts, uh, which again have sometimes been called star clocks, are found on coffins in a funerary context. So the context in which we're discovering many of these is not, let's say, a scientific uh, or uh, other astronomical um, context, but it's actually the funerary context because these gods are seen in the inscriptions, tell us a lot about that, as protecting the deceased, and the deceased actually wanted to join the gods. Uh, in the celestial abode. Now, the reason these are called star clocks or star tables, we can see here, and I'll just briefly point this out just from looking at a small section of this. When you look at these star names, these names represent what's called the decans. Okay, so decans, another reference like the decade, the 10 day week, the decans were stars or actually groups of stars that the Egyptians would use to tell time at night by looking at how they were related to other stars. So for example, when you're looking at this, notice that this name of the star is repeated throughout in this diagonal pattern. Each of these names all the way across are repeated like that. So sometimes these are called diagonal star clocks. And what you're looking at is in any particular row, this star signals the first hour of the night, the second hour of the night, the third hour of the night, and these are grouped by weeks, so decades within each season. So for example, if we look at a drawing, you can sort of see um, how these create this diagonal pattern. And if we laid out in a grid, a sort of idealized version of how this would look, and if we gave numbers, to the individual decans, so the individual stars or groups of stars that uh, the Egyptians were using to tell time at night. Let's say the first decan, second, third, fourth, there were 36 of these. 36 because um, one for each 10 degrees of the 360 degrees that um, would represent the night sky or the ecliptic, right? So the, the path of the sun uh, that goes around the sky as seen from Earth, right? Obviously, Earth is doing the revolving around the sun, but from our vantage point, it looks as if the sun moves across the sky. So in this particular week, the first decade or the first 10 days of the first month of Akit, this star rising at night would signal hour one of the night this star, hour two, this star, hour three. And those relationships between the stars would allow the Egyptians to know what time it is in the middle of the night. So these astronomers were watching for this 
So they knew when to, for example, um, perform particular rituals at the proper hour. And again, because it can be kind of difficult to conceptualize exactly how this works, first let's look at, at a bit of a graphic again. So again, here's the earth going around the sun. At any particular night, you would see 12 of these stars that were the Egyptians chose to represent those 12 hours of the night. All of these other stars you wouldn't see during that night from this side of the earth, right? The, other, the dark side of the earth at night. Every 10 days, this one would disappear. So it would set, you wouldn't see it anymore. And the next star would appear. So by having a chart like you see here, an Egyptian could take this chart. They know what week it is and what season is. They go out at night and as long as they can identify which stars or groups of stars these names represent, they would know which hour of the night it was based on which stars uh, were highest in the sky and the relationship between them. And so just to give you a sort of sense um, of how this works, um, and I just want to preface this a little bit, okay? For the most part, very few of these decans, these stars or groups of stars that were used for telling time at night by the Egyptians, very few of them have been identified with um, known stars or constellations that we know. Okay, so I want to preface that first. So what I'm about to show you is a way that this would work, but I'm using different stars. It doesn't represent exactly 10 degrees. I just want to give you an example, okay, of how this, this would look if you were standing outside at night trying to use such a chart. So let's say when Aldebaran rises up, that signals the first hour of the night, then you're waiting for the next bright star. Okay, Betelgeuse shows up, that's hour number two. Hour number two lasts until Procyon shows up. Now that would signal hour number three. Now again, I just wanna make sure that it's clear. These aren't, these do not represent Egyptian decans or exactly the way this worked. This is just an example of how the process that you would go through watching these stars rise at night and their relationships by which you would be able to tell which hour it was during the night because the relationships of the stars in the sky, which one had risen, which one hadn't yet. So you could use these catalogs, which in the surviving examples are on coffins, but presumably uh, you would use a papyrus copy, for example, you would be able to figure out uh, what hour it was, what time it was in the middle of the night. And as I mentioned, when we are looking at this, um, this graphic, the earlier decans, as they rise up, eventually will set. So for example, one of the main decans was actually the star Sirius that we talked about earlier uh, for its heliacal rise before sunrise signaling the Nile flood. Of course, eventually, you know, every night, the star is going to set in the west after it rose in the east, but eventually that star would have set before the sun went down. So then it would no longer be useful as a decan. And so as that happens, that's what's happening in these catalogs. The first decan here drops off, then the second decan for this week signals the first hour of the night, then after 10 days it drops off, then the third decan signals the first hour of this week, etc., all the way through this process. And as you can see with the letters at the end, these are decans that were assigned specifically for those five epigominal days at the end of the calendar. So these decan stars or groups of stars, which we might, okay, we can call them asterisms, small groups of stars, they were used then to tell time at night, to separate the hours of the night. And these decans, although they were in some ways abandoned for their practical purpose, meaning when we look at the evidence, okay, if we go back to objects as evidence, and we're looking at these star clocks, these coffin lids with these tables on them, we know that they only work sort of at a certain time. And like, let's say the late first intermediate period in uh, Middle Kingdom of ancient Egypt. So you're talking about, let's say, roughly 2100 BC. And you need to recalibrate them as um, things change in the night sky. So what that means is they sort of get abandoned for other timekeeping devices later in Egyptian history, um, but they are maintained uh, into, and I should just say here too, I'll, I'll pause here in just a minute and answer some, some questions about where we're at and can have a little discussion of what we've talked about so far. 
but these decans um, continue to be used in the sort of astrological function, particularly in the Hellenistic period, but all the way into the, uh, the, the Middle Ages, they're incorporated into a wide variety of texts, but perhaps most famously, uh, the corpus of texts that's often called the Hermetica, or the more specific version, the Corpus Hermeticum. And any of you who um, are interested in astrology or maybe uh, medieval magic uh, or just medieval texts in general have probably heard of the Hermetica. It's basically a set of texts that the authorship is ascribed to a figure named Hermes Trismegistus, which is an avatar of the ancient Egyptian god Thoth. And in this Hermetic corpus, so in this corpus ascribed to Hermes Trismegistus, which is, has all kinds of um, various uh, properties. They're sort of uh, often neoplatonic philosophical dialogues. Um, the decans are referred to as the hour watchers. And that's what you're seeing on the screen here is a, a quote about that. So these decan, the concepts of the decans are maintained up into the medieval period, but they're not really used in the medieval period. They're replaced uh, throughout Egyptian history and later with other timekeeping devices, which I'll talk about next. So I'll pause at this point and I'd be happy to answer any questions. We have a lot of great questions coming in. Um, so thank you, Foy. Uh, here's one to start with. This is from Lisa Socket. How did the Egyptians come up with these different calendars? How many years, centuries, millennia did it take for them to develop these systems? In a sense, we know that they had, um, we see the practice, we see the knowledge, but do you have any sense of how it came about? And yeah. then I know Adriana also has a question too. Sure. Um, well, I mean, the first, that first question is a tough one because what we see is the vestiges only of the creation process. So what I mean by that is in, let's say, 3000 BC, when you're getting your first Egyptian text, your very earliest hieroglyphic text date to about 3250, and the earliest ones not, aren't necessarily giving you that much information about this, although already at that time, it's clear that there's a civil calendar so that civil calendar of 365 days structured into the three seasons of four months each, that is there already at the beginning of Egyptian history. Hmm. So for us to, all we can do is speculate basically based on evidence that you see about what was going on before that. So to give you an example, uh, one of the scholars who worked a lot on this, Richard Parker, um, looked at various evidence for the existence of multiple lunar calendars from ancient Egypt. So not just one lunar calendar, but several of them that the Egyptians were structuring, uh, for example, their A, agricultural year around, and B, their feast calendars. So a couple of things to keep in mind is that certain natural occurrences help to structure this, right? So number one, the Earth's uh, revolution around the sun gave a sort of framework. Also, the rise of the Nile every year, which signaled the beginning of the uh, Egyptians' agricultural year. The fact that ancient Egypt was entirely an agricultural society. These natural factors structured a bit of how this would have developed. And then sort of the details of it is largely, to be honest, lost. And there's lots and lots of discussion and scholars, you can imagine, disagree on all kinds of points of details. Um, but largely that civil calendar and those lunar calendars are, were already in existence by the time we get our first text. So the simple answer is to say we don't know and that the sort of birth of these um, conceptions are lost to prehistory. Adriana, do you want to follow up? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, we have a question that has been asked in a couple different ways by a few different people, but it, it's basically relating to the different uh, social roles of people in society and timekeeping. So uh, this one comes to us from Rebecca Rudolph, who asks, were these timekeeping devices typically used by the royal or priestly class due to their roles and positions in society, or would the lower common classes have a different way of keeping time? Yeah, this is a, a, a perfect, uh, a very good question. Excellent question. Um, you know, the Again, this is <laughs> what you'll see when you uh, 
ask questions is I, I tend to uh, nuance them. So the simple answer is that all of the stuff I'm showing you and all of the text I'm showing you are filtered through an elite lens. So they're filtered through the literate individuals in society, largely the scribes. So not, not that we have time to get into all of this, but um, in ancient Egypt, the estimated literacy rate has been between one and 10%. So 99 to 99% of people in ancient Egypt couldn't read or write. Um, most of them are probably largely not involved in these direct, certainly they had a better understanding of the night sky than we do today. I mean, you can think about even in uh, uh, the Middle Ages, how the, the sky was used to tell time and to navigate much more readily than we would today. So certainly the, let's say, larger populace or let's say peasant farmers in ancient Egypt had some conceptions of that, but largely what I'm describing for you and these star clocks and the priests involved, this represents an elite attitude. And it's important actually to keep in mind that when we're talking about objects as evidence, especially that all of this evidence that I'm discussing is filtered through this elite lens. The, again, the simple answer is to say, we basically have very little idea what the quote unquote average ancient Egyptian uh, would know and how deep their uh, knowledge would be on many of these subjects because we don't have their viewpoints, right? We have the viewpoints of the literate um, population who could write the text and sort of controlled society and were part of the royal court. We don't really have that as much um, from the average Egyptian. I tend to think just in a gut instinct that it would have been much higher than you might imagine based on, again, um, looking at comparisons in say the Middle Ages. Um, but lots of what uh, we'll be talking about today is filtered through that priestly lens. Do you want to try one more? I, I would love to do one more. Okay. Um, and this, this also has come up in a couple different ways, but um, what is the relationship between the gods and the stars and then the charts? And so did the gods live on the stars? Were the gods stars? And then were the charts meant to transport people to those particular places or just to help them keep track or know where the gods were? Excellent. Yeah, good question. So um, the stars and the planets were thought of as deities. They're actually sometimes uh, the ancient Egyptian word for god, Netur, is actually applied directly to things like, for example, the planets that you can see with the naked eye, the unaided uh, naked eye. They would actually call them gods. So uh, these were seen, these astral phenomena were absolutely seen as manifestations of deities. So just like the sun was seen as the sun god Ray, uh, there was various gods associated with the moon. So Khonsu, I mentioned in the talk, but also Thoth, uh, the Ibis god that we're looking at on the screen now, um, were associated with the moon. We have this goddess uh, uh, Sopdet, who's associated with the star Sirius, Osiris with the constellation of Orion. So part one is yes, um, the stars were seen as divine manifestations. And yes, they exist in a part of the cosmos that the Egyptians definitely wanted to join after death. So what happens, again, we don't have time to get into all of this, um, but I should just say too, um, you'll see my email uh, on the screen at the end of this, so we can always talk about it more. You can feel free to email me. Um, at death, the Egyptians basically wanted to become gods along with the other gods. Their texts were very explicit about this. There is some debate in Egyptology, but in my opinion, uh, they're quite explicit, um, that they want to go and become and join the gods. And what happens when they join the gods is they actually join this cycle, the something that we can call the solar Osirian cycle. I sort of mentioned that up at the beginning when I was talking about Neha and Jet. Uh, Jet, this linear time, was actually associated with the god Osiris and Neha with the god Ray, the sun god. And basically these gods, you can envision them as being on a celestial continuum. So as Ray is born in the morning, then he's at middle age at, at noon, he gets old at night. When he dies and goes down to, at, at sunset, he goes down into the underworld where he joins with Osiris and is reborn. The deceased sought to join that same cycle. And the reason is they wanted to live forever. What happens forever? 
the sun rises and sets each day, sort of for eternity. So this was their method of joining the gods. So yes, including this type of material, the text, as I said, on the top of the coffins, uh, actually in some cases say it very specifically. Um, so um, it'll say, for example, uh, let's say, Newt, the goddess of the sky, raise up the deceased who is in this coffin, or um, Orion, you know, Osiris, Sach, the, the sort of um, constellation Orion, lift up this deceased person, you know, bring them in with you. So yes, it was all about the deceased joining with these deities. Um, but in other circumstances, outside of the funerary culture, where we have our surviving evidence, these maps would allow you to tell time at night. Okay, so thanks for the questions. I will stop again in a few minutes, but I, I want to move on if that's okay, Emily. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Because I want to I want to jump to some of our other stuff. So we've been talking right. about using um, these stars, the Deccan stars, um, to tell time at night. So you might wonder, well, what do you do uh, in ancient Egypt when you want to tell time during the day? Well, you had a number of devices for that. Um, you had devices like, you might imagine, sundials, but also devices uh, such as shadow clocks. And before we get into a real discussion of shadow clocks, I want to talk about this particular piece from the Oriental Institute collection and how it relates to those shadow clocks. So this piece, which um, your reading discusses, and in a few uh, slides here, I'll, I'll stop, I'll pause for a minute and again to talk about this and take a couple other questions about it. But this piece is in the Oriental Institute collection. It's on display. It's often referred to as the astronomical instrument of Tutankhamun. Yes, the famous uh, King Tut, because it's inscribed with his name on each side. Um, and so the real question is, is, what is this and how does it work? But also when we're, again, thinking about objects as evidence, what does this tell us about various aspects of ancient Egyptian society. So the first thing I want to do is just look at the text very briefly that you find on this particular instrument on each side. You see it's a, a royal inscription that um, references um, King Tut. They call him the perfect god who acts with his arms for his father Amun. Amun is a main uh, Egyptian god, sort of the state god of the New Kingdom at this time. Remember, we're at the end of the 14th century BC when this is being inscribed. Amun placed him, being Tutankhamun, upon his thrones, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Neb Keperu Re, son of Re Tutankhamun. So this is Tutankhamun's titulary, ruler of Upper Egypt and Heliopolis. Well, what is this thing for? This is what it says. It's a renewal of the monument of the father of his father. And if you did the, the reading, this should jump out at you. Men Keperu Re, or uh, Tuthmosis IV, so an earlier Egyptian pharaoh, radiant of crowns given life like Ray forever. So what this inscription is saying is that this piece is a renewal of the monument, so dedicated to one of Tutankhamun's royal predecessors, Tuthmosis IV, and dedicated probably as potentially, well, I'll sort of say this up front, potentially as a votive item to the god Amun. Um, and this is also listed again on the same side a very similar inscription, almost identical in wording, but slightly different, where it mentions Tutankhamun uh, renewing the monument of the father of his father, Tuthmosis IV. And so what I'd like to do is just pause for a second, and um, I can take another question or two about this piece, especially if you did the reading. Uh, I'm wondering um, how you would interpret uh, this, especially in light of all the debate about King Tut's lineage, if you know anything about um, the discussions around that uh, and the identification of King Tut's father, which I'll, I'll talk about in one second. Uh, but I can take a question or two before, before that. We don't have anything quite specific okay. to this text, but maybe you could elaborate on yeah, King that's Tut no, and his that's no problem. Uh, too fast, probably, for everybody. That's fine. Um, so what I want to show you here is the word that we translate here as father of his father on this uh, inscription. This is it from each side. So here is from one side, here from the other side. This is a hieroglyphic representation of this. And the word for father in ancient Egyptian is this word. We pronounce it as eat, so the word for father. And notice how there's multiple signs here instead of just this one. Well, what this allows us to do is read this in a couple of different ways. 
One way is we can read this as Et Etef in Egyptian, or the father of his father. That's one option. Another option is to read this Et Et Et, or the father of the father of his father. Now, why would this matter in terms of ancient Egyptian culture and history? Well, we either have King Tut referring to Tutmosis IV as the father of his father, or so his grandfather, or his great grandfather. Now, when you put Tutmosis IV and King Tut on a list of kings, and for this, by the way, we're going to ignore Smenkare here, notice that in the list that we know of, King Tut is these three steps away from Tutmosis IV. Well, if we read this as father of his father, it means we're skipping Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV in the middle. And in some ways, this would make sense. For those of you who are at all familiar with this period of Egyptian history, uh, you would know that Akhenaten is this iconoclast pharaoh who sort of got rid of all the other gods but one god and it's instituted a sort of pseudo-monotheistic type uh, theology. He moved the capital of the country to a new capital of his own, started this new cult, and also a very large revolution in the artistic style. Well, when King Tut came to the throne, um, there was a sort of anti-Amarna, anti-Akhenaten backlash. And so they were chiseling out Akhenaten's names from the inscriptions. And in fact, we have many other inscriptions where King Tut calls his father Amenhotep III. Now, in general, nobody thinks, or I shouldn't say nobody, very few people think that Amenhotep III is the biological father of King Tut. They think that this is um, a theological skipping over of Akhenaten so that they don't mention him because he's, he's experiencing, you know, a, 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 a um, demnatio memoriae, right? They're, they're trying to erase his existence from Egyptian history. But one thing I want to point out here, again, if we're looking at this closely uh, as, as a particular object with its own evidence, notice that on one side, oops, let's just go back and look at this a little bit closer. On one side of this piece, the inscription is nearly perfect on both sides. But on one side, only this word is badly damaged and chiseled out, which looks suspiciously like it was done on purpose. And if it was done on purpose, you would think that this is a reference to the father of the father of the father, meaning they're specifically mentioning Akhenaten, and somebody came along afterwards and dug that word out of the one side of the inscription. Now, this could just be accidental damage. We don't know, uh, but it's suspicious only in the sense that basically the entire inscription is perfect. I mean, I have a little damage here, but we can read all of that except for this one. Uh, set of glyphs. So um, the short answer here is that we're not sure exactly how to read this. Many people have read it like this, the father of his father, meaning the reference to Amenhotep III as the father, like in other inscriptions. But there's been a few uh, scholars who have noted that this type of writing typically refers to the great-grandfather, the father of the father of the father. So this is a sort of not completely solved issue but shows you the relationship to the complicated history of the end of the 18th dynasty. Okay, so that was just using this object in the OI as um, evidence for what's going on. But of course, I haven't explained yet, well, what is this object? Well, in ancient Egyptian, this object is called a merchet, and it's used as a device. Generally, actually, the merchet is uh, a shadow clock. I'll talk about how that works in a second. But with this particular piece, it's been thought uh, and, and reconstructed as a device that would help you sight stars as they crossed the middle of the sky. So if there was an imaginary middle line here called the meridian, as the star went across the sky, you would use a little wooden stick with a viewing uh, notch, and you would use this piece, the merchet, in order to keep everything nice and level so that you knew exactly when the star crossed this meridian. Now, this piece in this display is a recreation, but it's based on an actual example uh, that's in the Berlin Museum. So we have the sighting stick and the Merchet tool. So the way that this has been reconstructed, just to give you a couple of examples um, by Richard Parker and others, is that two priests would sit uh, and to observe the stars, one seated facing north, 
uh, who uses this sighting stick, the other seated facing him who could see the stars behind. The inscriptions list particular stars from the beginning of the 12 hours of the night and indicate that they can be seen over the left shoulder, over the right shoulder, over the ear, etc. So this individual was watching for how the stars passed over uh, the other priest that's working with him. So many people uh, have reconstructed this basically as this tool uh, to keep your sighting stick level. However, shadow clocks in ancient Egypt have this exact design. So for example, here is um, uh, another uh, example of a merchet. Uh, this one inscribed in a certain way, I'll show you in a second, from Berlin. Here's one from the Louvre, and notice these lines on the top. These shadow clocks work by orienting them so that the sun cast a shadow across the top of the device. And depending on the length of the shadow, it would tell you the hour during the day. And the one in Berlin actually has the hours labeled with various Egyptian words and phrases to denote the different hours of the day that this shadow clock could indicate. So by casting a shadow using this section of the shadow clock, you would have a shadow raked across the device and it would help you tell the hour during the day. Now, with the Oriental Institute piece, in every way, it's the same as the shadow clocks, except in one very important way. There's no marks on the top of the device to indicate the hours. So that is where there's been not necessarily confusion, but sort of debate in the scholarly literature exactly how this instrument was used, um, because it looks very much like these other examples of shadow clocks, which were used to tell time during the day. And we have other examples of these clocks that are sloped, which is what you see in the hieroglyph here for the writing of the, the term, Merchet, the name of this tool. And this is how they might be used. You would set them up, the plumb bob would keep them level, and the shadow would be cast across the slant, sloped face and the markings for the different hours during the day. Now, something like this, it's fairly simple technology, but you can actually use it in extremely useful ways. So for example, a recent article was written about how the Egyptians could have used um, basically a sundial or a shadow stick. And if you use it on the equinox, you can lay out a very accurate east-west orientation for the sides of your pyramids. So this was a hypothetical reconstruction of how the pyramids were laid out and how they made them so exact. So this type of technology was useful not just for telling time, but also for these other uh, surveying uh, um, jobs. Now, we have other texts associated with measuring devices. These are cubit rods. So this is basically the yardstick, you might say, or the, the ruler of ancient Egypt. And these rulers, these yardsticks, actually, in certain cases, include instructions for making clocks. On the one hand, shadow clocks and where to place the marks for the different uh, lengths of the hour of, of the day, and then also water clocks. So how to use um, these other um, water clocks. And I want to turn to water clocks, but before I do that, Emily, I can take maybe one or two quick questions. I see that there's a few in there, but yeah, we do. Go ahead, Adriana. We have a couple of questions. Um, one of the most interesting ones, I think, for me, uh, it comes from a couple of people, Peggy Kaz and Michelle Chambers. Um, it uh, is about when the Egyptians marked the start of daytime hours, at which point in terms of uh, sunlight, dawn, sunrise, was it at midnight? Um, when, when did the day start for them? Right, so uh, essentially, and sorry, was there another one? I was going to add, add a little addendum, which yeah. is, and what if it's cloudy out? Yeah, good. Or these the are, weather doesn't cooperate? <laughs> these are all good questions. So first off, um, in general, um, the day sort of started, I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain this correctly. The, the day sort of started with sunrise. However, those first two hours of um, the day were often um, not necessarily trackable by some of these tools because maybe the sun wasn't high enough in the sky yet or if it was at night for example the stars uh, weren't in um, weren't visible yet so for example in typically the day started with sunrise but usually the first two hours of the day so basically dawn and the last two hours of the day basically dusk 
um, were difficult to uh, control because of the type of devices that you had. So things with like shadow clocks, until the sun's up high enough, you're not gonna be able to cast the right kind of shadow. And also with stars at night, until it's dark enough, you're not gonna necessarily see um, the bright stars that you need to determine the hour. So the Egyptians divided the day sort of schematically into 12 hours of daytime. But of course, remember, because that uh, amount of sunlight changes throughout the year, the actual length of those hours shrank during the winter and stretched during the summer. And the ones at the very beginning of the day when the first sun was just rising, those first couple of hours and then the last couple of hours were the ones uh, that were often um, not necessarily accounted for at all the timekeeping devices. Now, Emily raises an important question, which sort of brings me to, to the next point here. So I'll, I'll come back to some other questions here in just a minute. Um, is what do you do when um, it's cloudy out and you can't see the sun or you can't see the stars at night? And the uh, Egyptians invented a remarkable device, the water clock, which you can use to measure uh, the hours regardless of what you can see in the sky. And this was particularly useful at night, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, there's inscriptions on these that indicate um, exactly their use. So this is an example of one of these water clocks that we have on display in the Oriental Institute, and I gave you a short reading about. And actually it's mentioned, if we go back to those descriptions of how the Egyptians are using the night sky for timekeeping, it was actually mentioned in one of these descriptions where Richard Parker said, uh, the effort for such precision points, so looking at uh, the night sky and using these clocks, to the use of the water clock as an independent means of marking when an hour had ended. And it emphasizes well the reluctance of the Egyptians to completely abandon telling time at night by the stars. But indeed, a water clock of the Ptolemaic period has an inscription on its rim that its purpose is to tell the hours of the night only when the decanal stars cannot be seen. So when you have a cloudy night or a night where you can't see um, these stars, uh, this is when you use can use your water clock also or in con, uh, combination to tell the time. So this is the water clock that has this inscription and it says on it, every figure in its hour in order to measure the night hours when the Deccan stars are no longer visible so that you're not going to miss any of the rituals. Now these water clocks are being studied by a colleague of mine named Annette Schomburg and she's developed again an online database. You can go explore these. This is one of the most famous ones called the uh, Karnak Klepsidra. This is the earliest one that we have. This is from uh, the reign of Amenhotep III. So we were just talking about Amenhotep III um, as the father of the father of King Tut, right? So two uh, pharaohs before King Tut. And these are decorated with uh, scenes related to the calendar year, the sky. So you can see, for example, some of the constellations in the middle. Um, and then there in the interior, they have calibration marks for telling time. Now, um, just to give a little plug, for example, if you go to Annette's uh, website, you can do some really great things uh, with what she has up there. She has these 3D, um, 3D models, which you can manipulate in all kinds of ways. And here you can see the decoration around the outside, but then as this spins to the inside, you can see the calibration marks, but also around the edge, the name of the months and these calibration marks are for the hours related to that uh, individual month, that time of the year. Now, the one in the Oriental Institute has been published and talked about by my colleague, Robert Rittner, and I gave you his part of his article uh, to read as part of the um, handout for this. So the way that these worked is that you filled it with water, water would drip out the side, and as the water reduced on the inside, you would tell the time by the markings that are calibrated on the inside of the water clock. So this is what some of these markings might look like. And to show you sort of how this works, as the water drained out and the water went down, it would reveal the marks of the different hours associated with the different weeks of the year. So first uh, week of, uh, first month of Akit, sorry, the months of the year, first month of Akit, second month, etc. And these are the different hour marks that as the water ran out of the water clock, you could look inside in the interior and use these uh, markings to know the hour uh, when this happened. And there's actually some really interesting um, uh, descriptions about these water clocks, even in Horopalo's hieroglyphica, so this 
maybe let's say um, fifth century uh, treatise on Egyptian hieroglyphs, uh, where they talk about using the symbol of the baboon, uh, where he says they use that symbol because the baboon voids its urine 12 times a day, once an hour. So it's a symbol uh, for the hours, um, these baboons, because again, this sort of folk etymology around the urination schedule of a baboon. Now, if you did some of the reading, uh, what you'll, you'll perhaps notice is that this particular water clock uh, was left unfinished. And again, I'll stop here in just a minute and take a question or two before I, I try to get to the last part of our lecture. Um, was left unfinished, and you can see that with the unfinished cartouches. And um, because of its art style and unfinished nature, um, Robert Ricker, my colleague, wanted to date this to the Roman period. So he thinks this is first or second century, or maybe even later uh, AD. Um, so a later example, perhaps the latest example of these water clocks that go back to, again, uh, the reign of at least Amenhotep III, but I'll mention in a second the inscription that we have from an even earlier period about this. Um, and these water clocks, along with the symbol of the baboon, um, could be offered actually by the pharaoh back to the gods. So this is a little symbol called the Shebet, which basically symbolizes time, but it's sort of a model water clock. And you can see that very well when we look at votive examples, uh, which probably didn't actually work in the same way. Um, I mean, these were votive, so they were meant to, as an offering, not actually as a water, working water clock, but you can see they had the same idea uh, in a miniature form. So I can pause very quickly and take maybe one or two quick questions, Emily, and then I wanna talk very briefly about the uh, inscription, about the invention of one of these um, before we run out of time. Yeah, great, and you're right that I am getting a little worried about time. We yes. have a few words at the end we always wanna say, yeah. so, and invite people to our next lecture. But we have a great question from Briona Freyholtz, who asks, is it possible that extra water might evaporate and make it so the readings are off in these water clocks? We know it can be quite hot in Egypt. It, it could happen, but again, for the most part, these types of water clocks were used at night, so there would be less concern uh, with evaporation. Um, but it does also signal that they had a very good understanding, probably of the mathematics of how uh, this drainage would work because if you didn't do it exactly right, obviously it wouldn't keep time uh, in the right way. Okay, so for the sake of time, let me um, finish up here by talking about, we have an inscription, so remember these water clocks, which were used as timekeeping devices, they sort of supplant later uh, those earlier systems like the decanal system using the stars. Um, and our earliest one was from the reign of Amenhotep III, as we mentioned, but we have this inscription that goes back to Amenhotep I. So this is around, let's say, 1515 or so, circa 1500 BC, in which a man named Amen Imhat uh, claims to have invented, in a way, the water clock. And this is, um, inscription's been the subject of work by a colleague of mine named Alexander von Lieven, who's discussed this. And just to sort of summarize it for you, because we're running a bit short on time, basically what uh, Amen Imhat says is he studies the writings in the temple, he realizes that uh, in that study that there's a difference between the hours of the day and the night throughout the seasons, and he goes to um, make um, a particularly nice and interesting um, water clock. And what he says here uh, is that he starts describing how the gods associated with this water clock go up and down in front of him. He also made a shadow clock, a merchet, calibrated to the year. So he's making a very finely calibrated um, clock both a water clock and a shadow clock, it seems, um, that's uh, designed for the different seasons, the different times of the year, um, and calibrated when entering summer during the harvest in the phases of the moon, when it, uh, uh, which arrives at its time each hour according to its day while the water flows out through one pipe. So you see that he's talking about not just making, um, let's see, any particular water clock, but A, one that seems to be both a water clock vessel he describes it uh, very clearly as um, a trapezoidal vessel in the inscription, um, but also that perhaps has one of these merchites, these shadow clocks involved. But notice that he talks about the goddesses going up and down in front of him. And what Alexander von Lieven has interpreted this as is automata. So that is little figures that would rise and fall with the rising and falling of the water of the clock, which would make this by far one of the earliest 
examples of automata that we have attested if this interpretation is correct. And this has been compared to other water clocks of other periods. Uh, Catesidius, you know, his very famous one, Archimedes, where these figures would go up and down as the water uh, rose and fell inside the clock. So Amenemhat studies the text uh, of the temple, discovers these things, and then constructs this very um, intricate clepsedra, perhaps with moving figures, which would be absolutely um, amazing if that uh, interpretation of the text is true. So what we see here is A, a number of methods by which the Egyptians try to structure temporal divisions in their lives for both practical and religious ends, but then also some boasting about the sort of scientific achievement and how the generation of um, scientific knowledge worked in ancient Egypt with Amenemhat talking about studying these uh, ancient texts. So with that, we're coming uh, very short on time. So um, I'll be happy to take uh, a few final questions uh, before we turn it over to Emily for um, final remarks. And I should also just say that if you're interested in reading things like this, here's the word that's referring to these water clocks and that inscription, we are running um, an introductory, introductory Egyptian hieroglyphs class at the Oriental Institute uh, that starts in October. We'll be doing it over Zoom just like this, so you can take it from anywhere in the world. Um, if you're interested, um, the links are found on the uh, Graham uh, website as well. So I can take uh, one or two questions uh, before we finish up, Emily. Um, we have a very sort of practical related question on the OI website. Are there good resources or resources that would be useful for kids as well? Yes. Um, so if you go to the OI's general page, and I can put that uh, in the chat box here in just a second, um, there's actually uh, lots and lots of uh, educator and, and children exercises that the OI has been putting together, especially right now during this pandemic period. They've been putting out things every week on various topics. Um, so you can either go to the website or, in fact, uh, follow the OI on any of its social media channels, and you'll get all of that stuff. Thank you so much, uh, Foy, for that really interesting lecture. I have a question about, I noticed at the beginning you mentioned that, uh, or some of the information about the objects was when they were acquired. And I noticed that they were not acquired by the OI until around the 1920s and 30s. And I was wondering if you could, in keeping with our theme this week, talk a little bit about um, whether the OI is very, has a like rigorous provenance history and how that might affect um, how we think about these objects as evidence for the kinds of insights that you have been uh, teaching us about. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question um, and, and pertinent and timely as well. So in general, what's really special about a place like the OI is that the vast majority of its collections are actually uh, derived from its own excavations. So uh, particularly uh, with collections outside of Egypt, um, m the vast majority of the collection is derived from excavations that the Oriental Institute conducted, which means we have all of that information about their find spot, about uh, the exact uh, nature of their recovery, et cetera. With Egypt, however, our Egypt collection, there's a large portion of it that has had been purchased in the early 20th century. So basically by, let's say 1935, pretty much everything that's in the Egyptian collection uh, had been purchased, largely by the founder of the Oriental Institute, a man named James Henry Breasted. And at that time, it was common and legal uh, for people traveling uh, in Egypt to buy antiquities from largely um, Egyptian antiquities dealers. Um, in fact, um, for example, the astronomical instrument, the shadow clock of King Tut that I showed you, uh, that was purchased in the late 19th century. It was sold several times, and, and Breasted actually found it um, in a London antiquities uh, dealer's uh, shop when he bought it uh, around 1923. So the OI today, okay, doesn't purchase or um, acquire any objects whatsoever. Um, so uh, ever since the UNESCO laws uh, that uh, allow countries to com retain complete control over their own cultural heritage. The OI has not acquired anything uh, like that by big purchase. And of course, with those laws, um, for example, when you excavate in Egypt, 
you know, 100 years ago, they would give you a share of the fines as part of the excavation. And of course, they don't do that any longer. So the OI's collection has, for all essential purposes, has been closed for the last 70 or so years since it was um, established uh, at the beginning of its history. So for the excavated material, we obviously have excellent records uh, and as much information as you could expect from that time period about where these objects came from. But with the purchase material, obviously a lot of that chain is gone. So just to, because I know Emily wants to finish up, just to give you a quick example with the astronomical instrument, um, we don't even know where that was found. And because of the lack of a provenience, so we have some provenance, we can trace it back to the late 19th century when it was uh, purchased, but before that, we can't trace it back to its place of origin. There's been a lot of discussion about, well, where did it come from? Did it come from the tomb of Tutmosis IV? That seems very unlikely. It didn't come from the tomb of King Tut, we know that. So what exactly was it used for? Where was it found? It's in great condition, so it must have been placed mm -hmm. in some type of cache, protective cache. So um, because of that lack of clear provenience for some of that, it complicates our interpretation of what these were actually used for um, when they were made. Hopefully that'll, that dances around some kind of answer for that. That was great. Boy, I wanna thank you for um, this really amazing lecture. And it's really amazing both all the sophisticated technology and thought that the Egyptians had and possessed and used to understand the world around them. But it's also so impressive how much you know about <laughs> what the ancient Egyptians thought and did and understood. Do you want to say something briefly about these courses that are upcoming at the OI? Sure. So the, the OI offers um, adult education quarters, uh, courses every quarter. Uh, and they're on all types of uh, topics related to uh, what the OI does, the study of the Middle East and the ancient Middle East. So I'll be doing an introductory hieroglyphs class starting on October 5th. That'll run for eight weeks. It'll be very intro. So you don't need any kind of background. It's, it's designed for adult learners who are just, you know, they want to get into it. Um, Tasha Vorderstrasse, uh, who runs our adult education program, will be teaching a course on Nubian Queens, which I'm sure will be very popular and, and fascinating. And then a graduate student that we have in Egyptology, Rebecca Wang, she will be talking about uh, travel in ancient Egypt at another course that's upcoming. And these courses, um, different set of courses are taught every quarter uh, and on a whole variety of topics. We just had one that was running on papyrological Greek, so reading Greek on papyri. Um, we've taught courses on Egyptian religion, magic, um, various collectors on courses about the OI itself, the history of our disciplines, et cetera. So um, if you keep an eye on the OI site, you'll see that every few weeks or so we have new courses posted uh, that can be taken now from anywhere in the world. Um, we'll be teaching you live over Zoom. Great. Uh, can we pull up the next slide, Gus? We also have a few courses at Graham. So you can take a course at the OI. You could also complement that with a course at Graham. And those are a couple, a few that we think are related to this material that might interest you. And we also, I'll post in the chat box our whole course catalog. And then of course, next slide, please. We also, one of the sort of core offerings that we have at Graham relates to the basic program, which is our great books program. And people are devoted to this course of study. And there's going to be, upcoming soon, some sample lectures. So if you've always wanted to read those great books and you haven't had the chance to, or you did it when you were young and, and not mature enough to really appreciate them all, then this is your chance to, to delve into them. And people really speak so highly of this program. Um, and then finally, of course, I would love to see all of you at our next event, which is on Thursday, and we are featuring on that day the Smart Museum with Professor Leslie Wilson and Claudia, Br Professor Claudia Brittenham. Um, and it's going to, they're each going to do some presentations about objects as evidence. So we continue the theme. So I hope you will, you will join us then. Boy, is there anything you want to add? And boy, I just, first of all, I really want to say how terrific this lecture was. It was, you have an amazing balance of animation and exciting <laughs> presentations, and then these ancient objects that you really bring to life. 
And so I thank you for that. Is there any last word that you want to share with the audience? Sure. I mean, the one thing that I would say is first off, I'd like to thank you, Emily, for, for uh, the excellent organization of all this and, and Gus and everybody as well. Um, but actually, yeah, the, the one thing that I would like to say that to follow up on this, um, you know, when I give a lot of these, I, I give a fair amount of public lectures around Chicago land to libraries and um, other communities. And the one thing I, I like to help people, people keep in mind is maybe a bit of a bigger picture of why we should care about ancient Egypt or Egyptology and, and talking about something as maybe esoteric as how ancient Egyptians keep time. And what I would say is that one of the purposes that I, I like to do these kinds of talks for broader audiences is um, to expand your understanding and sympathy and compassion for people who are different than us. And I feel like if I can um, communicate that to you and develop a sympathy for uh, a culture that's as distant in time as ancient Egypt, uh, an ancient African culture, um, and a sympathy and understanding that I hope that, that we can translate that into our sympathy and understanding for each other today. So I, I do have a, a bigger sort of broader goal in mind. It's not just about the minutia of hieroglyphs and uh, Egyptian conceptions of time, but I think by looking at this and, and seeking to understand it, it helps us to, to really um, apply that understanding and sympathy to each other. That is wonderful. And with that, I think that brings us to eight o'clock and to our end. Thank you, Foy. Thank you, Adriano. Thank you, Gus, behind the scenes. And I hope to see all of you again on Thursday. Bye-bye. <laughs>